Next up, we have one of the leading educators in functional medicine in the UK, Dr. Mike Ash. And he's going to be talking about the underlying causative factors that contribute to the majority of non-communicable disease. Take it away. So I'm going to try to provide some sort of uh, interface between why these things work and why they may not work. Because there's a great tendency to think of delivering care through protocol structures. It makes sense. It's much easier to kind of learn if someone presents with X, I give them Y. And that process is very much more attractive to many people. Whereas what we're looking at is a systems approach, which often means there's no single point of intervention. There's often many points of intervention. And one of the challenges for everybody looking after people who are ill is trying to work out what is the best point of intervention for the least resistance in order to get the fastest possible outcome of improvement. To do that, there's a degree of understanding that I'm going to try and tease out, crushing three years of training into the next 40 minutes. <laughs> there are a lot of learning objectives. I'm not going to read through them except for the first one. You're getting a, a sense by now that inappropriate or unresolved inflammation sits at the nexus of disturbed metabolic functionality. If the rhythm of inflammation and recovery is disrupted and someone changes their relationship, it has a metabolic effect, which depending on their own predispositions, history, environment, genetics, can manifest as a disease. Now, at the end of the day, you're not going to be given an exam, but these are some of the questions, of course, that are the best, worst answers ever received in the exam. Now, most people remember homeostasis is a principle in which we are perceiving we're enjoying some degree of cellular and metabolic health. So the question is, what is the definition of homeostasis? And the worst answer was, someone who stays at home and does not move very much. <laughs> and to a large extent, there is a truth in the people that we see don't move very much. And therefore, their homeostatic balance has been reset to a new level, which, as you'll learn, is really creating an inflammatory milieu, that is, an environment that's easily triggered. So Thomas Merton says that happiness is not a matter of intensity, but of balance and order, rhythm and harmony. If we swapped happiness for inflammation, that gives us a sense of the flow, the communication or the dialogue that takes place. And if we're unable to manufacture appropriate anti-inflammatory responses, a reset position, the new dynamic leads to persistent cellular and metabolic dysfunction in the person that we're looking after. Inflammation is extensively written about in multiple journals and depending on your time frame we've picked out what we think are probably some of the most contemporaneous ones that if you feel the enthusiasm is still with you at the end of the day, then you can read these in your own time. But there are many different layers and I'm going to give you a very nutritionally orientated process working through different systems. And why am I going to do that? Well, first of all, nutrition is a tool that pretty much everybody understands exists, but most people don't know how to use it properly. And certainly most of your patients don't know how to use it properly. And so we're going to give you a sort of a, a lift up a skill set that you can leave with today to learn how to use this because there are multiple reasons why somebody's inflammatory response may become disruptive or overactive from sterile inflammation due to local cellular damage or to antigenic stimulation and in particular a disturbance within the ecology of the organisms that reside within your GI tract. Now Ronger has given you a clue that the loss of diversity induces a change in capability or functionality. Everybody that you see, uh, everybody in this room, has less diverse bacterial species than your parents, and certainly less so than your grandparents. Every generation going forward, we're seeing less capacity to absorb challenge in the, micro in the microbial teamwork that you have in your gut because of a loss of diversity. And naturally, as we age, we become more inflammatory. To try and pull all of this together, there's a great quote from Dr. Solomon, which is that clinicians need to become more comfortable with the untidy methodological pluralism, which is developing in medicine and part of what today is about, rather than thinking along the evidence-based medicine routine. Because knowledge derived from populations remains informative for clinical decision-making, but should no longer be unconditionally preferred. How do we personalize 
the translational impact of a lifestyle change to somebody who's sitting across the table from you, often frightened, fearful, and generally very poor at remembering most of what you say. So underlying the systems web and the personal profile and the prescription that you're being described today, there are seven core clinical imbalances to do with defense, energy, assimilation, biotransformation, and so on. And I'm going to give you a very short little overview of each section, but I'm going to concentrate a lot on the immune elements that tie all of these together. There is a constant thread throughout of a series of changes, and there are three principal mechanisms that cover all of the non-communicable and many of the acute diseases that you see, which is that there are an infinite number of challenges an individual can experience for which it will result in oxidative stress, inflammation, and immune dysfunction, which should self-correct. But the people that we're seeing are not self-correcting. And there's a limited number of responses which manifest as a range of illnesses and diseases. And if you leave today thinking, what can I do? There's two questions I think are really helpful to ask yourself when you're listening to somebody tell you what their problems are. The first is, does this person need to be rid of something? Do they need to take something out of their diet, out of their life, out of their relationship? Is there something they need to take away to help them to feel better? And do they have an unmet need? Is there something that they need to add to their life to improve their health and their well-being? And then if you can think of what they are, often the simplest thing to do is to assign one mutually agreed intervention to start with. So whilst you've had some case histories where there's been a number of things going on, in the time frame that you have allocated, even delivering one intervention that's accepted and acknowledged and taken on board, if you choose it correctly by understanding where in the systems you wish to target, you can still provide a significant improvement. And so I was asked to give a single sentence to describe all of this a few years ago, which is identifying the best target for a heterogeneous collection of patients, that diverse group of people in your waiting room, in whom there's a wide range or diverse immunopathogenic mechanisms are activated, requires multi-layered iterative strategies to get safe, effective outcomes. One intervention is not going to fix a problem, but one intervention can shift the problem, can shift the dynamic, can change that homeostatic set point in order that the next one becomes cumulative. And then we have that threshold event where after a while they become self-engaging and self-empowered. And if we don't start making our patients self-empowered, this country will be bankrupt. The cost of type two diabetes alone is going to cost 2.5% of GDP by 2040. That's just one NCD. We have to get people to take personal responsibility without blaming, engaging, and encouraging to do so. Back in 1933, Walensis said for dysbiosis, which just means a change in the normal relationship between the bacterial species in the gut and the host cannot be cut out of a structure of life for independent treatment, nor can new biosis, which is a stable, healthy bacterial mix in the gut, be treated intelligently except in its totality. It's all embracing oneness. That is the wholeness, the entire environmental impact that takes place within that individual. René Dubois, 50 years ago, said that microbial contributions to health often only become apparent when they're disrupted. When someone becomes unwell and you restore it, do you begin to appreciate the value of a balanced bacteria in the gut in terms of health? Right up to today, in fact, just 10 days ago, in the BMJ, the role of the gut microbiome in systemic inflammatory disease. This is not a new subject, but it's a new way of understanding it in order to translate this into something that gives credibility to your thought process. To communicate something effectively, there must be some confidence and belief in the information that's being transferred. Everybody in this room is intellectually expecting to be reassured by the application of what they do. And that message is immediately translated to the recipient. If you have no confidence, if you have no trust in what you're doing, it won't work. 
there must be that dialogue that comes from an inherent belief that you're giving information that is valid, safe, and effective. Now, there are 10, well, there are more than 10, but I've chosen 10 for you, core principles for improving immune competence. And by competence, I mean tolerance. And tolerance is a difficult concept in immunology to grasp completely from scratch, but essentially, it's the way in which a restoration from a perturbation returns you to the previous state of healthy, stable immune response. And we produce a set of cells in our body that facilitate that to happen, and we can manipulate those cells through the appropriate selection of foods and food concentrates. A 101 memory for you from those days of what is the immune system. Just very simply, the innate is pre-recorded, it's germline encoded, it's going to be with you when you're born. So we say well, this is your pre-PLM event. You have a set of responses, they're hardlined, and they're going to react to certain events. And we're only going to concentrate on the epithelial barriers and digestive function. And on the adaptive side, we have two different divisions, cell and humoral, and this is a learning environment. This can be educated. We can provide it with training in order that it can become more competent. And we do that through a specialized system of cells known as antigen-presenting cells. And that's how we can enter the immune system by providing material to those APCs to change different subsets of cells. And in particular, we're looking at regulatory T cells. Now, these may be a new subset of cells to you, but they've been known about for 18 to 20 years. They're very, very powerful, and they're made predominantly in the periphery, which means in the gut. We make some centrally from the thymus, but most of them are made by their environmental exposure. So you take a naive T cell, you give it an education, and if you give it the right education, it will become a regulatory T cell. If you give it the wrong education, it becomes an effector T cell and sprays defense molecules around. So in very simple terms, the more naturally occurring regulatory T cells we can induce in the patient, the greater ability they have to resist inflammatory disturbances. Mm -hmm.